All right, so I guess we've hit our official start time. Um, thank you. Welcome to the post-lunch coma phase of our day two. Um, I'll speak slowly because I know a couple people are, are coming in still. Uh, my name is Jason Pomentel. I know some of you have um, seen me introduce myself already. I'm one of the organizers here. Um, I'm also somebody who's been tinkering with Drupal for a long time, but just tinkering in general for most of my life. I have um, uh, very vivid memories of taking my bicycle apart when I was about six and having my dad sit there and stare at me until I put it all back together. So um, even though I started out working as uh, studying graphic design and really having kind of a passion for the arts, um, technology has always been a part and sort of tinkering with things has always been a part of who I am from a very early age. And that's probably why I love Drupal so much and I love learning your slides aren't up. Have they ever been up? Rats. Pardon the technical difficulties. Are we getting something up there now? Hey, there you go. There's a desktop. And it's not mirroring. Okay. I feel like such a rookie. All right, there we go. Let's try this again. That's not really giving me much helpful. Command shift F. All right, this is pretty low resolution. Hopefully this will still work. This will work badly. All right, zooming out, maybe that'll do it. Okay, so Jason Pomentel, that's me. I will pause momentarily as things start wrapping weirdly again because I didn't realize the resolution was this low. Um, so I've been tinkering for a long time. I've been working, um, working on the web uh, since 1994. So this is actually year 20 um, of a very confused career. And uh, I, like I said, I tend to do a lot of things with design and tech, and that's why I really uh, love this intersection of design and front end and back end and everything with Drupal. And um, with Drupal 8 and with this new way of developing themes, um, I thought it was really important that we have an introduction to it at this camp. And sadly, we are down 100% in our Danish component for the speaking slot in this. We were supposed to have Morton here, so I'm sorry I don't have the beard, I don't have the accent, and I can't swear as eloquently as Morton, but I will do my best to give you a good introduction to Twig, which is a thing that we will all come to know and love, I'm sure, starting in about the next 10 minutes. Um, I have a small shop in Providence with my wife where we do web design and strategy and we also build a lot of things in Drupal for various clients, um, universities and high tech companies. And I uh, also host along with a couple guys in this room and another one who's floating around here somewhere, um, the local meetups in Providence for Drupal and also a weekly show called Talking Drupal. It's a broadcast live as a Google Hangout every week and you can find out more about that at talkingdrupal.com. And we've had a lot of guests on there talking about a lot of these weird intersections of design and technology. And since this was sort of a last minute thing for me to fill in for Morton and give this talk, I thought it would be wise for me to do this with somebody else who actually knows this stuff really well. And Eric is down here in the front row and is gonna be talking about Twig and REST APIs immediately after this across the hall in room 144. And uh, Eric, I've known for a couple years now, um, three or four maybe, yeah. and um, and he's he and his partner have a fantastic business doing Drupal development and uh, do a lot of really amazing work, and he's doing a lot of training with Twig, and so I thought I should bring my own expert in here. Um, he's been doing Drupal for a very long time. Um, he calls himself a front-end developer. He has a far greater sense of style than that would lend you to believe. Um, so he really has a great understanding of how design and, and front end are supposed to fit together and knows how to ask the right questions, which is pretty awesome. Um, apparently he's not invincible, but maybe kind of highly bullet it, resistant. It's probably perhaps. likely. 
Yeah, it, it may be likely. So, uh, so that's a little bit about Eric. I'm sure if he chimes in later on, he'll be able to tell you a little bit more about himself. But we're here to talk about Twig. So Twig is a template engine and is just simply a different language and syntax for us to be using in Drupal 8 going forward to create and, and develop our Drupal themes. And you might want to know why. Well, because this one is actually a very modern one. It's one that's been developed over the last several years that has been done in conjunction and very tight coupling with Symfony, which is the major component uh, under the hood behind Drupal 8. And it is also in use in a number of other content management systems, um, not the least of which is Craft, which is actually a very highly regarded one used by a lot of top design firms. It's also very similar to what's used in Expression Engine, and that's probably because the guy that developed Twig came from the Expression Engine world. So there's a lot of similarities and crossover there. It's not exactly the same, but there's a ton of documentation for it that we'll get to. And I wanted to get into some of the reasons why this is important. Because I'm sure a lot of you in here have been developing Drupal themes for a long time, and you're probably just starting to feel like you're really getting good at it and getting comfortable with the functions and how to navigate the arrays and all of those sorts of things. And that's kind of like saying you like Microsoft Word. You've just learned to live with it well enough that you don't question all of the idiocy that you go through to use it to its fullest extent. So why would we want to do this besides the fact that we've been just working around stuff for all this time? Well, it's because it's fast. It's because it's concise. It's really full featured. It's easy to learn. It's extensible. It's unit tested. It's documented. It has clear error messages that you can actually understand. And it's highly secure. So it really has all of these fantastic reasons why we should use something that's not just built by us. And that is very much central to the heart of Drupal 8, is it's trying to get away from the not built here syndrome. So this is something that we face every time we talk to an IT director who is concerned about something that came from somewhere else, that wasn't built by somebody in that department. Well, we want something that's built by somebody else, by a whole team of thousands of somebody else's who are really, really smart and actively looking at making that thing better and just pulling that thing in and building the bridges where necessary to do the Drupal-y things that we need it to do. So this is a really smart approach. It's a huge evolution for the way Drupal theming actually works. And it's, it's a very important step forward, not only for us to be able to do our work better, but to open the doors to a much wider world of people that have experience with that technology to come in and work with Drupal as well. We're trying to level out the Drupal cliff. We don't want a learning cliff. We want to get it back to a curve and one that's actually manageable for people to climb without having to be pulled up by the rest of us in order to get them into the fold. Because right now, we are in the best possible scenario for people who are working in the web and working in IT and in design because everybody wants Drupal. We can't possibly print enough Drupal people fast enough to do all the work that there is right now. So doing some things to make Drupal easier to assimilate into a larger, uh, to a larger audience and a, a larger pool of people that might work with it is critically important for the success of the platform and for the long-term future that we have working with this product. So um, I will confess, this is an entirely cribbed presentation that Eric put together with Forrest Mars. And some of these things I am going to gloss over a little bit. We've adapted it some for, for what we want to talk about today. But we're going to take the whole thing. It's going to be up on GitHub by the end of the day. Um, this is all just uh, one of those reveal one-page JavaScript things with tons of samples in it. Um, but I want to show you some of the similarities and differences. So what you have here on the left and the right are some differences in syntax. On the left is PHP, on the right is Twig. So you'll see sometimes these things don't look all that different. Now, we have file names and function names that are fairly similar. But one of the things that you have to remember is if you want to have uh, like node dash dash article dot tpl dot php, you have to start writing functions to get that to work at the page level. Well, you don't have to do that with Twig because it's always going to work. It's actually built in there to have a whole series of different names that it will look for all the time. 
so that you need to override things down to a specific node, you can do that without having to write any more functions to get it to pick up that file. So that, that's a pretty important difference. So all the theme functions are now their own distinct markup files and there's one little debug flag that you can set to true in order to figure out what are all the possible file names that you could use, just like looking at the listing order of view templates. It works very much in the same way. So variables. Um, this actually is not the best way to look at it because just because of space we can't really show all that much. But again, left is PHP, right is, is doing things with Twig. And if we take a look at the way some of these syntaxes work, um, in PHP to get into an array where you've got the author, the author, the date, things that created, um, the way that works where you're setting these articles in here is not so different in Twig. But what we really get to, and that's, that's really kind of more important, um, is that you have natively in here better conditional structures and logic that you can use in Twig that are not, they're still going to be sandboxed so that you can't blow up your entire site by doing it badly. Um, it really is a, a much more robust way of doing it. And you'll see the syntax is just a little bit more succinct than having to break things out with PHP tags and, and everything else. So um, it will actually help you write stuff a lot faster. Now the control structures, again, also a little bit simpler. So there's a little bit less that you have to write out for each one. Um, filters actually are um, much more powerful here. And there you can do a lot more with them. So in this one on the left, we, we want to check plane and make sure the title doesn't have any sort of illegal characters and that sort of thing. Um, it's title, vertical pipe, strip tags. That's it. That's all you've got to do. Um, it's really safe. It's really quick and really easy. Um, similarly, translate functions are, are done in kind of the same way. It's either a string or a variable, a vertical pipe and a T. Um, so the filters are actually incredibly powerful, and there are a lot of them. Well, the cool thing about filters, too, is that you can chain them together and you don't get into parenthetical hell anymore. So that's, uh, in, the, in the way this stuff is structured, it's gonna be so much simpler for you to reach into these things and get only the bits that you want. Um, so if you're reaching into the attributes for a particular element that's coming out and you just want the classes, you can get just the classes by doing like attribute.class. So like the syntax is much simpler for you to be able to get the stuff that you want to write the markup that you, that you need. So again, more, um, examples here of how you might use this. I'm going to breeze through some of these because it's just really hard to, to actually make good code comparisons here. You'll be able to look at all this stuff right from GitHub or look at a PDF of this by the end of the day. Um, white space is not something that's so terribly important to us some of the time, but it would be really nice if we could be a little bit more minimal in what goes up on the server. So we want it to be readable when we're working on it, but we want it to be compressed when it actually is being served as a page. So having things like this that we're, that we're writing out by simply adding in these little hyphens on either side will echo it out without any ex extra line breaks. So that actually will render out as just a single, uh, single line instead of uh, like the nested indented stuff that you might want to look at when you're in your development environment. Um, documentation. Um, there's lots. There's a whole website from Sensio Labs that's dedicated to, to really great, thorough, professional documentation of the entire language. Um, there's links to that stuff at the end. Um, you have like crazy little things like spaceless. So then you can actually compress things even more when they get output. And that's really a, a nice, um, valuable thing to be able to add. Uh, this is, I think, a note for me from, uh, from Eric about yeah. um, not all of these things are functioning in alpha 13 right now of Drupal, which I think is Drupal 8, which is, I think, the most recent release as of a day or two ago. Um, so some of the things that we're talking about are the way it is supposed to work. It may not be the way it's working today. But the last time I checked, we were down to only three or four beta blocking bugs before Drupal 8 comes out. So it's actually a very close corner that we're getting to uh, to be at the point where we can actually start working with Drupal 8 um, if we are not quite as brave as the folks from Last Call Media. So some twig basics. Um, there are three basic operators that you'll be using in the course of writing your, your template files in a, in a Drupal theme. Um, so that is this sort of dot notation. 
um, foo being the variable name and bar being the thing that you want to print out. So some, like the attributes of this Elvis field that's being printed out and the classes that might come with it. Now, if you want to set variables, this is the syntax that, would you, that you would use, set the variable name. And you'll note double curly braces versus curly brace and percent. That's the, the way that Twig understands how these things should be functioning. And then, of course, comments. Now, here are more of these filters. So if you have an element in the content that's coming out for your node, and one of those is a form element, you form.label will get you the label of that form, or form.class or attributes will get all the other attributes that would be echoed out in the markup there. And you can also exclude things. So if you want to actually render this out, these attributes, without having the classes, you just say without this thing. Um, and then making sure that something always gets changed to an alias for, for a URL. It's really easy to get the node ID, and then you can turn that into whatever the reference alias is. Though on the left here are all the filters that are actually built into Twig. So this is just cribbed right from the documentation there. So you can go to the Twig documentation site and learn lots more about the filters that are available. The ones on the right are Drupal specific. Writing your own custom filters is fairly easy too, and there's documentation for that. Awesome. Um, the typographer in me is just wincing right now, but I just okay, there's just not anything I can do. <laughs> okay, so the dot notation. This is one of the things that will make your life so much easier when you start working with this rather than these really ridiculously complex arrays that we try and reach into to grab that one field. So being able to say, I would like attributes dot class and be able to get just the classes that you want to write out. Um, this is all really important because one of the things that you need to remember about the way Twig works in general is that there's no more embedded HTML. It's not there. The only things that are in, that's right, there is no pre-compiled HTML in the data that comes out of the database. Modules are not inserting it. It's not coming in from core. The markup that's here is the markup that you want. And I believe if I'm quoting Morton correctly, all our markup belongs to us, Woo. finally. So that's the basic syntax. And of course, there's always exclusions. So if you have a hyphen in there, this is how you would work around it um, in general. Just don't put hyphens there, and then you're fine. Um, now, the template inheritance. This is another one of these things. Um, I'm going to show you how to see all of this. This is just absolutely fantastic. There's already this whole list, just like I said with the view templates, of what are all the template names that it's going to look for for that particular thing. And what you have to know is that as it's assembling all of these templates to build up the page and the block areas and the individual elements, it's not rendering any HTML until it has all of them together. This is a very important thing to keep in mind. It is not rendering any HTML until the end of the cycle of this page being assembled. And that gives us 100% control over what we want that markup to be. That means we can tailor this to go anywhere. We can make it a JSON feed. We can make it syndicatable content. If we want it on our watch, we can get exactly the markup that we need to make it render correctly on our watch. And that's something that, this is why we had preprocess functions in the first place. And this is why they are not allowed to be there in Drupal 8. There will be no theme preprocess functions because we don't have to have them there. That's a very important thing for us to keep in mind. Now, the theme functions are still being converted. So this is another one of these things. If you want to help out on Sunday, good themers make great twig template checkers. Believe me, this is the one thing that I actually learned something about to make a useful contribution to core, was to be able to look at some of the templates that need to be converted to Twig and then review them for the way they're being structured. So on Sunday, this would be a wonderful thing for you to be able to get involved with and figure out how you can help make some of these final conversions happen. Um, there's lots of functions about converting dates, but I think if somebody says, can you make the date look like this? All of us cringe a little bit on the inside because we know how many steps we're going to have to go through to get the date to look exactly like that. Um, the functions are far simpler. It looks a little bit more like that. That is literally the entire function and file for the date in D8, one line. 
as it should be. So there, there's a lot of things that are going to get a lot easier in, in working with this. And so like the, things like item lists. Now, if I were to actually scroll through all of this, you see there's just a crazy amount of stuff that's going in there to build up an, an unordered list. And if we look at this one, that's it. Rats, get back here. So like there's no scrolling. That's, that's kind of it. So it, it, again, it's much more concise in order to build these things. Um, links, again, similarly, that's showing about 15 or 20 percent of the amount of code to do it in the current PHP engine. That's 75 percent of the code right there. Um, breadcrumbs, another nightmare to actually be able to put together and theme and make work exactly the way you want them to work. That's all the code that you need to do it with Twig. So a lot of things that we've had to jump through a lot of hoops for are getting a whole lot simpler with a whole lot less code to write. And wow, this is just awful. As a guy that usually gives talks about typography, this is killing me. I just, you need to know that. It's okay, it's slang. It's twig debugging for the gangster. Ah, uh, exactly, cool. right. Um, now, exactly, I just was not cool enough to come up with that. Um, right, right. So, um, the other thing to, to keep in mind is the way these, uh, the way D8 handles this stuff um, really has been optimized for performance from the ground up. So that means by default, it is pre-compiling all of these twig templates and storing everything in memory, which is really fantastic as a default posture in Drupal 8. It is really difficult to theme without turning it off. So just bear in mind that it's there, but know that it's a really simple thing. In development, you change one variable and you can just eliminate all of that, get all your, your theme suggestions, and have access to all the debugging information, and it will reload code every time the source code changes. So twig debug is what you want to do. In your settings file, you set settings twig debug equals true. And what that's going to do a number of things. It's going to make sure that the, every time the source code changes, the, the template files are recompiling. It's also going to echo out a bunch of really helpful information. So it surrounds the twig code in the template with a bunch of HTML comments that tell you things like, here are all the possible file names that will be looked for in order in order to process this code. So that you can have it at a theme level, but then also at a specific node level and be able to override things in a natural manner without having to write any additional functions. And this will, if you look at the source code, you'll see all those comments just echoed right out. Um, just note that that will cause automated tests to fail. So when you're doing your testing on a module or something like that, you just want to make sure you turn the debugging off. But that should be pretty understandable. Now, the dump function. This is one that I cannot stress to you how useful this is going to be. So as a themer, you know that like a lot of the time what we end up doing is having to do things like echo out the entire node variable with a print R with pre-tags wrapped around it in order for us to actually be able to parse through this whole thing and actually find the stuff that we want to change or use the develop module or something like that. But this dump function, you can insert into your template file and I will either dump out everything that's on the entire page or you can supply specific ones if you want to just dump out attributes or dump out the title or some other piece of what's being echoed out. And if you look in Drupal 8 and take a look at the Bardic theme, there's a ton of hints in the comments there already to show you some of the variables that are available in every page. But if you just echo out like this, this dump without specifying any more than that, you'll actually get everything printed out for you and it's really easy to look through and follow. Um, again, with this debug set to true, that means all template files are going to be automatically recompiled every time the source code changes. So it does make it a lot easier for you to go about working on your theming without having to go and change settings in the Drupal site on and off that are, are going to be you know, causing a lot of sort of really like lengthy reloads on pages and stuff like that. Um, just make sure that you don't leave it on in production. That is just, you know, word to the wise. It does default to false. So if you haven't specified, specifically turned it on, it will always default to off. Well, and you should never commit your settings.php anyways. Fair enough. Fair enough. Can you uh, for uh, specific templates? Or, or is it on, it's on for everything? It's global. 
Yeah, I, I don't think that there's a way to do that for I think a specific doesn't page. It, uh, someone can correct me. Uh, Forrest, does it, is it part of the comp variable? So it's, it's part of the comp variable, so it's global, right? Yeah, that was one. Okay. Okay. Um, now, twig auto reload is a slightly different way of going about this. So you don't want to turn on debugging across the whole site, but you might want to turn on auto reload in order to facilitate the, the theming. You might not want to, to have it sort of going whole hog into turning all the debug stuff on. So instead of setting debug equals true, you could set twig auto reload to true, and small changes that you're making in theme files will be recompiled right away. So now if you don't specify it here, it defaults to the value based on twig debug that we were just talking about. Um, again, don't do that in production. Shame on you if you did. Um, twig cache. Here's another, another thing that you can uh, know is there and play around with the settings on it if need be. Um, if you set it to false, again, if there's no cache, then it's not going to be able to store anything that's, that's compiled. That's a little bit drastic and that might really slow things down. You can do it, but you might want to just think about the auto reload if all you're doing is changing some template files. Um, now, this the default with it being off means that things are compiled and they're actually stored in the file system rather than in memory. Um, so there's different things about performance there. Um, I, I don't know if there's a better way to explain. I, I mean, basically. Not without going into great detail. Okay, well, never mind. We'll keep this at a little bit higher level. Um, okay, so again, you've got cache, you've got debug, you've got um, auto reload. These are all tools that you have in your arsenal to be a little bit more aggressive or less aggressive in what you want to be recompiling on every single page load during the development process. So things like having auto reload on might be something that is not a big deal for you to have on while people are actively working on content and doing site building and you're working on theming. Something like turning off cache or setting debug to true might be a lot more disruptive and really sort of hang up a lot of page load times. Macros. Now, this is something that um, I, I'm just really getting my head around, but I, I think that there's some incredibly useful stuff that, that you can do with this. Um, essentially, this is like functions for markup, but you can do things like write out a template file for how to build up a menu in a very generic sense, but not specific to a particular menu. You essentially turn that into a macro function that you could feed any list array into and turn that into a menu with the markup that you want. Just by calling it with this Im import that menu.twig, which you've saved out as a separate file, and then feed it the name of the menu that you want rendered back this way. So quite often you end up with more than one menu structure that you're using throughout a site. This way you don't have to write template files for each one of them, you write one and then always give you back a rendered array that has the same markup, which you would generally want to do and determine by the wrapping class how you might be styling it. And, and the beauty of especially a macro like this is, I mean, can I get a raise of hands of who's done a uh, hook menu tree alter? How many of you have also had to alter the submenu of links? You have to write a new function. In, in Twig, you call the same function by saying self. So you're only writing it once and you're just reiterating through it as many times. Yeah, actually this is something that's really worth pointing out. Right here, that's the recursion. Mm -hmm. So that takes care of going all the way down the tree without having to do anything more complex. So it really is quite powerful and that's the extent of what you have to write to do it. And this is just one instance. If there's some pattern of markup that you end up using often, then you can write more of these files and actually save your... And you know, this becomes the snippets that you just include into your theme that will handle these things over and over again for you. Okay, libraries. So this is something that um, I, I think is also really important to, to sort of make core to how you work. It is another one of these things that I think is still Always a little changing. bit wonky in the alpha state, but um, the idea is to make it a lot simpler for you to build to bring libraries into your theme, external libraries, whether they're JavaScript or, or otherwise, um, so that you bring in, in a, a YAML file, in the configuration of your theme, what libraries you want to have and what dependencies there are for them. 
and uh, essentially what you're doing with this is um, being able to call a specific file um, in these YAML files so that you can kind of establish where these dependencies are and build, build these things into your theme, and they will then be loaded in and aggregated in the same way as anything else that comes from core. Yeah, and just to note, as of Alpha 13, libraries in the info file doesn't work anymore. Awesome. Libraries declared in the info file? Yeah, they don't work in the info file anymore. Yeah, this has changed three times so in the last three put, versions. You put all your libraries in the info file, now you have to put the libraries file that will not work for the info file. Great. Good to know. People that know more about this than I. Uh, okay, so documentation. Um, so this is actually getting to the end of the slides that we have here, and I added in a few things uh, to help you get going with this. Um, PHP.net has lots of easy documentation to find. It's the same kind of thing. Twig.senseolabs.org, that's the thing that you want to remember in terms of general documentation about Twig. There's reams of it there. It's really well done. Um, it's very well thought out and easy to get to. So that's, that's something that uh, is a great starting point. And I've also added some other resources in here that I think are really useful. If you start out from Drupal.org slash theme-guide slash eight, that's a great starting point to dig into tons of resources on Drupal.org and elsewhere that people have put together on creating a Drupal 8 theme, how to go about it, what's the stuff that's Drupal specific. Um, the other thing that I would also recommend at the same time is deconstructing some of the ones that are being supplied with Drupal 8. So like pulling Bardic apart um, will give you some good insights on how to put one together. I don't think that it's necessarily the best example of a theme to start with, but it will at least show you how to work with Twig and how it's been converted from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. Um, this one's really long, but it was a great article. So again, um, my GitHub repo is github.com slash jpommentel. I will have this up here just as a fork off the original repo by the end of the day today. I'll probably be doing it during the next session. And I'll also make available slides and I will tweet all of this stuff out to the conference hashtag as well. So if you keep an eye on that, then you'll see that within the next couple hours. Um, so that is the extent of the slides. And I'm purposely hoping to have plenty of time here, and I think we do, so that we can just have lots of discussion about this. If anybody here has specific questions or if we want to just talk about the basics or we can just pull up some code and look at it on an existing uh, a D8 alpha site that I have installed here. So anybody have any questions? Question. Um, you mentioned early on that Twig was from the same designer or developer who did Expression Engine, which I have a little experience with. And in Expression Engine, my data was in my database and I did every little bit of HTML in the templating side. Is that the direction we're going here? Yes, absolutely. So my views, I'm not going to be using fences and all these other things to strip stuff out that views are putting in? I would hope not. Excuse me? I would hope not. That's, that's the goal. So, so the goal is, like currently, when you load a page, you have a node variable. And in that node variable, there is a whole lot of stuff, a lot of which is actually rendered HTML. That's not going to be there. There's not going to be any rendered HTML in there other than something that's being pulled out of a content management system like a blob of, uh, blob of text on a page, like the body field. Mm -hmm. That's the only place there would be markup. All the rest of it has to be supplied by the theme. Yeah, and a good thing to note is that the actual antecedent to Twig is uh, Django's templating engine. Um, and if anyone's messed with Django, it's, it's pretty much the same syntax, um, different, some different filters that are supplied and whatnot. But it's, it's really easy to use once you actually wrap your head around how simplistic it is. I mean, essentially, um, so if, if we... I was going to say, just a, a, I think you said expression engine. I'm not familiar with any, any connection between that. I think you're thinking of the uh, Python framework, I'm sure, that I'm running a road before. And you just, someone said, Twig is some author, some connection to expression engine. I've never heard that ever. Um, somebody mentioned it to me yesterday. So it's maybe wrong. Um, I've never used Expression Engine. So What's that? I've never used Expression Engine. Well, well Expression Engine is, uh, is from Ellis Software. Uh, Twig was written originally by Armin Groninger uh, for the 
CHIRP CMS, which was a Python-based CMS, and I forget what the original name was. It was Pyka or something like that. Something like that. And then that was then he rewrote it. So that was written in Python. Then he rewrote the same templating language uh, in PHP or for PHP, mm -hmm. and that was Twig. And then he left that die in mind. That might have actually done the one for CHIRP. Right. It just sat there forever. And then Faber and Potencia, who wrote Symphony, discovered it and said, this has amazing potential. Why is it just sitting here completely unmaintained? So he did that beautiful open source thing where he's like, hey, do you think um, maybe we could do something with it? And Armin says, no problem. You got it. Go. <laughs> and then he, he did. So, um, so I don't, I, regardless of what the similarity is or, or, or actual connections, certainly um, very much from a, a syntax standpoint and a conceptual standpoint, um, that is one of the reasons why a lot of top design agencies will only use Expression Engine because that's the one that they can use where they can completely control the markup. And that is exactly what we get with Twig. Do we have any other, any other questions? Because we've got lots of time for questions. Oh, yeah. No more devices. <laughs> does, does that mean I don't just <laughs> you had a question? Yeah, um, I really don't have enough information to give a question, so I'd really like to see some of the code. Sure. All right, so what, I've, what I'm pulling up here is, uh, this is actually, I think, alpha 13. Um, but I can pull up. So the organization is a little bit different. I'll have to bear with me for a second. Um, so I want to I pull up Bardic and show you what, what's here right now. So we have an info file similar to what our info file looks like now that's going to list things like style sheets and regions. And then you've got a libraries file, which is where external resources get listed. So like I said, some of this stuff is a little bit in, in flux. But if we want to take a look at what one of these templates looks like, so there's, there's tons of comments in here. So it's going to give you a lot of information about what variables are available. And if it's not in a comment here, then you can use that variable dump function that I, that I was telling you. And that's going to give you all of these. Um, it's also letting you know what the regions are and how to access them. So here's some examples of the way some of the syntax works. So you know all those conditionals that, we, that we're used to seeing if this thing exists, then we want to echo out this code. That stuff's still there. Can I? Um, if I had actually set it beforehand to recognize Twig as that, then yes, it would be. But yeah, yeah, it's, it works basically the same way. So you can see this, this has the percent, the curly brace percent. That's for defining variables and control structures. And then if you want to echo something out, then, uh, where'd, where'd it go? Here we go. So that's, that's the variable representing the, the front page. So it also has things set up in here immediately following that that would translate that term if translation is enabled for that site. Um, so that's uh, some of this syntax in action. So th again, there's not a ton of difference really other than the syntax between the, the, in the page template. 
It's when you start getting into the, the more granular elements where it really starts to show some of the power and differences. So if we look in the node template file, and you start to see echoing things out is really just curly braces and the name, things like the user picture. Now, down here, I think this is where you start to see things that you can kind of imagine might be a lot more useful. So our content variable is like the node variable. It's got all of that stuff in it. But to get at a specific piece of it, rather than having to go in and like, do I use the right arrow and the brackets and the quotes, or do I put square brackets around it if I want to reach into this particular element of that array, it's a dot. It's just a dot. It's all you have to do. So if I want the links that go with this page, content.links. If I want everything but the links, it's content without links. It's really simple. So, and, and again, like, like Eric said, you can chain these things. So if you wanted to, for example, get something like without this and without that. Without links, without comments. Right, exactly. So if you wanted to do something like, I would like to make this template one that is only going to be echoing out just the body copy effectively, mm -hmm. without links, without comments, good, you're done. So it's really easy to reach in and then customize what's being output there for different uses, whether it's you know, like equating this to view modes. Um, that's a really easy way for you to control that and then be able to put these things elsewhere on the page very easily because all of that stuff is being rendered at the end. So how easy or difficult is it right now if you want to have content in the sidebar that is a separate block region rather than where your content is being pulled out by node? Well, you're making a view. Mm -hmm. Or you're doing some other thing to get that content over there. Here you don't have to. It's just a template file that's being loaded, and it's going to be able to have access to that variable at the same time as the rest of the node template is. Um, on, to note without, um, you know, how the renderer right now, if you hide something before you print out content, it's smart enough to know that the things you've hidden shouldn't be output. Um, I think it, it doesn't work right now, but it, the end goal is to have without work the same way. Where if you could, then you could just print content and not have to, um, you know, call the things that you've left out. Right. Yeah, magic markup. It's, and where are they it compiles all the theme templates into one executable function that gets the arrays passed into it. It starts with writing sites files PHP. Right. Yeah, so it's an executable function. So when you disable the, the twig caching, it, it no longer does that. It actually renders all the files. And then where is the twig piece? Um, the, the twig. PHP library that's in core. I mean, that's what's yeah. processing all the templates and creating functions. I mean, it, so I think the, the best analogy is if you think about the way APC works when you set that up using the current setup, it's compiling the PHP code and storing that. It's not compiling the output, it's compiling the executable that can have things fed into it. So that's what APC does to make Drupal work faster, even for logged in users and on admin screens. That's what Twig has built in natively. So it's compiling it into something that can have the data fed into it, but it doesn't then have to do all of the interpretation of what the curly braces mean and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And you should yeah. never have to touch the compile function. Um, I'm not sure. If Twig is updatable outside of updating Drupal. So, so the answer is going to be the Drupal version could be pinned to whichever version of Twig, but Twig's really stable. It's not like it's not like Drupal. Not yeah. Like it's it's <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it, it is really really stable. It's not like oh, we, we're going to we really want this thing that's coming in the next version of Twig, and I need to upgrade my Twig outside of Drupal. That's really not going to happen. Um, so, you know, what what is interesting to me about this um, is that. Not only have we taken a bunch of things that used to be external modules that we had to install in order to make Drupal useful, like views, 
It's also starting to bring in other technologies at the other end that we always had to install to make Drupal performant. That's a pretty impressive thing to be able to do so that immediately out of the box, we have a platform that not only is easy to work with the model content, but it's easy to work with to theme. It's easy to, to build out content structures and displays of that content because you have views built in and view modes and all these sorts of things. But it will be a much more highly performant one because we can write better markup and because it has this kind of caching built in. That means we have less to do in optimizing the server. We may still want some of these other things like varnish and memcache and that sort of thing, but some of the need for this is going to go away. And that's a really, uh, and again, another critical thing in making Drupal easy to set up and deploy and adopt. Um, I can go into more of these, but I hope this is helping give you a little bit better idea of the, the nuts and bolts of it. Do you have Twig debugging enabled? Can we see the output of the template suggestions? Um, I could. Easily. Yeah, it's just a new template with the field name, machine name. Basically, oh, I do have it set. You can go view modes. Oh, yeah, you can build where rather than having a view mode. Yeah, so you can build view modes um, in the UI and then create a template for that view mode without having to go do a um, node pre process and write a template suggestion based on dollar view mode if it's set. Like it just, Twig knows that this is another display, so I'm just gonna add that machine. I don't think I have something set right. Because it's not, I'm not seeing the theme suggestions. Um, did you clear caches? Well, I had just turned on. Um, oh, you're gonna have to spam it. I think it's the render cache. So you're gonna have to spam the clear cache button. Development performance. It's probably not the best way to go about this. There you go. Oh, there we go. So with debugging on, we can see what file has just been, what function has been called, what file name suggestions are here, and the order in which they'll be executed. And the one that's being used. The one yep, with the, the one X, with the X. The last one on the side. So if we, if we wanted to be more and more specific, this is the node HTML twig file. This is also happens to be the full node view, the display mode. So it indicates that the next one, if I wanted to write a template file for all nodes in, in full, uh, in full view uh, display mode, then that would be the next one, node full HTML, um, node page for the content type, node page full for the content type and the display mode. So you can see it gives you a lot of flexibility built in without having to write any additional functions. So if we wanted to get to that most specific, I would like a template file for this full page display mode of the full content, I can do that without having to write any additional functions. So those one-off pages that you might need to create for something, very easily done here without having to do any extra code. Well, but that's, you can't, you can't know what that's gonna be. Right. I mean, you're asking something about how the server is delivering markup to a particular device. So unless you are, I mean, that that's sort of runs counter to the idea of it being responsive. If you wanted to do something like that that's adaptive page templates, you would have to do that either on an Nginx or Apache level because at that point it's the server serving up the function that's been compiled. So then you'll have to write some kind of Apache plugin that compiles separate functions based on each breakpoint you set. And then that's just adding complexity for the sake of adding complexity. Anybody have anything else that they want to want to see in the code while we're looking at this? Is everyone kind of understanding and following along as we go through this? 
Yeah, Danny? I see yeah. a few people nodding. What, what are you, what, what, what else can we clarify? So, um, I, you know, I had my first exposure to Twig about a year and a half ago at, at um, the DrupalCon in, in Sydney, and it was um, it was interesting to me, um, but I was not something that I was overly excited about. And ironically, it actually was, you know, within the last couple of weeks, finding out that we really needed to have an intro to Twig discussion and we didn't have anyone to give it, that gave me the excuse to start getting into this and figure out why it matters to me. Uh, because you know, above anything, I consider myself a designer. And, and next, I would consider myself a front-end person, and I think a, a relatively expert one. And, and then a themer and site builder and, and tinkerer of, of other sorts. And what I started to discover about Twig and about the differences between the way we work with Drupal right now and the way I work when I'm doing something where my deliverable is actually just nice clean HTML and CSS and JavaScript, um, there are some substantial differences in how I have to work. And those things are falling away the more we move to a system like this and the more you start thinking about all the places your content needs to be able to go and live like those discussions in Steve's talk this morning and other sessions that I've been to, and actually Christine's yesterday, if you think about all the places where your content needs to go, the way Drupal needs to live as a place where the content is created but not necessarily where the content is consumed, it's incredibly powerful and liberating for us to be able to think like we can write our own front end to this for any platform that we need to without taking away some of the best things about Drupal, which is the ability to model and structure and deliver that content in the first place. So that little voice in my ear of Jeremy Keith and his lovely Irish accent saying tut, tut, tut when he's looking at the markup that's coming out because it sucks, we can finally silence and please. And that's a really incredible thing to think that we could actually have a CMS as powerful as Drupal that actually delivers or has the ability to let us deliver a front end that is as good as everything else that we can do. And, and that way, this can be something that's in our toolbox to deliver the absolute best experience, the lightest weight experience, the most performant experience, the most highly refined visual experience, because we already know how to do that in the front end. We're not going to be constantly working around the way Drupal produces it in order to get it to the point where it can be what we want it to be. Leaner markup also lends itself easier to taking a prototype that someone who may not have necessarily known what Drupal's markup was going to be and then porting it to a Drupal theme a lot easier because now we don't have to deal with the divitis on multi-field elements that only have one value. Um, we can take someone's markup and just plug it into a template and use it. You know, change the classes and the style sheets to match what Drupal outputs and the prototype's now a theme. Yeah, I mean, all of the... I mean, I, I teach a lot of workshops in responsive design, and, and they're really very much geared toward designers. Um, so it's, it's very um, sort of like I don't get into a lot of more advanced front end technologies. It's all basic CSS and HTML. But all the code that we write there and we work on could very easily be turned into a theme now because we've got these nice clean structures that just have to have the content elements swapped in. And we have our nice, clean markup and a responsive site that we know is going to work everywhere. I mean, I heard somebody asking uh, several times in different sessions about supporting IE8 or support, supporting these other devices. And honestly, like really nice, clean, responsive pages can work pretty much anywhere. And a lot of the code that we started uh, writing and teaching in our first workshop was responsive in IE6 without any issue. And I'm not kidding, IE6. We have screenshots on a Palm Pixie. We have screenshots on Blackberries. We have screenshots on all these different tablet devices. That same code working in all of these environments in IE6, 7, and 8, and 9, and 10, and 11. And it's fine. People get that same equivalent experience that, they're, that they normally expect on there without any significant extra work on our part. And we can actually still deliver the best possible experience on the new stuff and still get all of the great responsiveness and great typography and all those things that we really want to have, it is not going to be pixel perfect, as some people might have mentioned, but that's okay. 
it's an equivalent experience that is going to be as good. And now Drupal can actually deliver that just as well because we can be very explicit about what we include and incorporate in our themes, what kind of what level of jQuery, what extra plugins we want to bring in, um, what, what conditionals we want to apply so that all these things get brought in in just the right way and we can be as careful about that as we are with everything else. Yeah, and if your mobile theme is usable, um, is it really that bad if someone in i6, 7, or 8 has to use the mobile theme on the desktop? Not really. But I mean, yeah, but honestly, it doesn't matter. Still Respond.js your makes it work just fine. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, like, that's, you know, things like that. Like, I, I don't understand why that still has to be an issue for people if you have good front end code to begin with. Mm -hmm. But it really should be fine. I think we're pretty much running out of time. We've got a couple minutes left, so say maybe one, two more questions are, I think we're done. All right, I guess that's it. Class dismissed. Thank you. Uh, if you want some more Twig mm. love, Forrest right over here is giving a training tomorrow on Twig. Full day, six hours. Eight hours. Actually, eight hours, <laughs> sorry. Um, with lunch. It's for working lunch. The, yeah, low, right. low, the low, low price of $350. Um, Jason is also giving his responsive web design boot camp. Um, for those of you who aren't necessarily ready to deep dive into Twig but want to learn some responsive design goodness, also with a working lunch for the low, low price of 350 So. And if you have more immediate concerns about Twig and REST APIs, immediately after this session, go hang out with Eric in room 144 across the hall, and he's going to be getting a little bit deeper into that curtain. So the Twig and REST API session is not a demonstration in code. It's not a how to prototype with Twig. It's more of a discussion on the roadmap forward for creating a Twig prototyping tool that is not only built with Drupal in mind, but as a true headless system that is framework agnostic. So if you know HTML already and this seems really interesting to you, come to the session. Thank Thanks you. again, everyone.